Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Welcome everybody to MTN Outdoors. I am once again your guide, Andy Curtis, and we are going to cover a lot of ground in this week's episode from a new way to save a very small but very important part of our ecosystem to a very old survival skill now being taught to Montana school kids right alongside with fostering a real appreciation and love of the great outdoors here in the Treasure State. But before we get to those stories, we're gonna start in our national parks. And yes, I'll even admit it, sometimes it's easy to forget how lucky we are to live here in Montana with both Glacier and Yellowstone right outside our front doors. And the nation's first national park is where we're gonna start things off. MTN's Penny Preston shows us how hunters played a crucial role in not only saving Yellowstone's iconic animals, but keeping them from getting wiped off the map completely. In 1872, Yellowstone was established as the world's first national park. The park was established to protect Yellowstone's thermal wonders, however, not its wildlife. But General Philip Sheridan wanted to protect the park's wildlife, which was being wiped out by market hunters. Center of the West Curator of History, Jeremy Johnston. His poachers were running elk into snowdrifts while they were still alive, prying open their mouths and cutting out the elk ivories. Sheridan asked his friend, Buffalo Bill Cody, to help, and he wrote an editorial for the New York Sun. Uh, the Secretary of the Interior did ban hunting. But poachers, like Edgar Howell from Cook City, Montana, ignored the law. In 1894, Soldiers caught him in the act of killing and beheading some of the last remaining bison in the park. Coincidentally, a hunting group called the Boone and Crockett Club had sent a reporter to the park who was there when Howe was arrested. Huff reported that Howe was turned loose. Uh, there was no punishment for him. And the outcry that came out of those articles really led Congress and the legislature to follow the lobbying efforts of the Boone and Crockett Club to create effective judicial system throughout Yellowstone National Park. That was the Lacey Act, which protects the park's wildlife today. How did a group of Eastern hunters come to protect animals in Yellowstone? In 1887, the conservationist, who earlier discovered thousands of animals had been killed by market hunters in the park, George Bird Grinnell, met Theodore Roosevelt to form the Boone and Crockett Club. Uh, the two of them met and decided that there needed to be a sporting organization that promoted a sportsman's code, as well as an organization that would protect wildlife habitat through the American West, especially Yellowstone National Park and the surrounding ecosystem. It was the model for a conservation hunting code that exists today all over America. So the wildlife we see in Yellowstone today was really a collective effort of the U.S. Army, officers like General Sheridan, naturalists like George Bird Grinnell, sport hunters like Theodore Roosevelt, and even former market hunters like William F. Buffalo Bill Cody. So in the early days of the park, it was soldiers and hunters, men with guns, who saved the wildlife of Yellowstone. For MTN News, I'm Penny Preston reporting for Yellowstone Revealed. All right, let's head north to Glacier National Park now, where these next two stories really showcase the beauty that is the crown of the continent. Whether it's in the dead of winter, like we're dealing with right now, or in a few mysterious paintings that are getting a touch up. MTN's Coulter Anstat will start things out for us on the trail. Here in Glacier National Park, the scenery can be just as beautiful in the winter with snow on the ground as it is any other time of the year. All you need is a little winter recreation equipment, and you can enjoy all the park has to offer. In the quiet beauty of Glacier National Park in the wintertime, the sound of snowshoes is not uncommon. Snowshoeing is not difficult. Anthony Nelson knows a thing or two about snowshoeing. He's the executive director of the Glacier Institute. We're the official education partner for Glacier National Park. So uh, essentially we help the park to achieve their educational goals. One way to do that is so through the Institute's snowshoe program. 
So what a lot of people miss as they're walking through um, is that there's actually an entire ecosystem underneath the snow. So it's called the subnavian layer. If you've got snow that's six inches deep or deeper, mm -hmm. um, the average temperature down there stays right around 32 degrees. Coming out on a, a snowshoe with the Glacier Institute is really an opportunity to slow down uh, and to, to really experience the park in the winter, uh, which is unfortunate how many people are missing it, uh, how many people are choosing not to come up uh, and experience how awesome this place is. But it also gives an opportunity to go in depth on a, the different things that you're seeing. Backcountry camping and cross-country skiing are also options in the park in the wintertime. A lot of our roads remain closed and unplowed, so it makes a perfect surface for cross-country skiing. Regardless of what you do in the park, Park Public Information Officer Gina Kurzman says preparation is important. That includes dressing appropriately, checking the weather, and checking avalanche reports. We have a very strong interagency partnership, and there are reports available that you can go on and check for avalanche danger for the areas you're traveling to. We do have staff here that can come in and help. People do need to realize, though, that there is no cell service in Glacier National Park. Important advice as you marvel in the beauty of all the park has to offer. For more information about recreation opportunities here in the park, click on the link in this story on our website. In Glacier National Park, Coulter Anstad, MTN News. It's just trying to get in right where the pigment's missing and just dabbing a little bit of this, this pastel color on there. 15 beautiful historic murals rescued from the brink of destruction. The story goes is that they were found, they were getting ready to be thrown out in Glacier Park and a family came across them, was able to rescue them and then they passed those down, this was in the 50s, and then the family passed those down to their granddaughter. Hockaday Museum of Art Executive Director Alyssa Cordova says the murals are believed to have been painted sometime around 1910. They were donated to the museum in 2012. These are over 100 years old and when they came to us they had been cut out of their frame so some of there was some damage there and they had hung in these lodges for many years so um, We've been working really hard over the last 10-15 um, years to get these all restored. The murals range in size anywhere from 4 to 13 feet wide and showcase iconic landscapes and geographical sites throughout the park. So for me to be the kind of middleman that gets to bring these paintings back to closer to what the artist intended them to look like, uh, that's a really neat thing. Art conservator Joe Abrusha has restored nine of the damaged murals. He is currently working on two pieces that will be finished in the coming months. Uh, sometimes you're just dotting, you know, just dotting things. But it's amazing how just to touch up little spots, how it just tightens up the whole piece as a whole. It's really satisfying. It's, it's, it's pretty neat. Once restored, Cordova says the murals are sent on loan to various buildings across the state. She says the restoration process is made possible thanks to community support, including a large monetary donation from the Whitefish Credit Union, allowing Joe to do his work. Because we really want these murals to be seen as much and by as many people as possible. So it's really been a community community project to get these all restored. Now the museum needs your help to find out who painted these murals as no signatures were found on any of the pieces of art. This is a mystery that is ongoing and we hope that maybe even someone in the public could help us solve if they have a family member, if they know some of that history. They were done probably by some artists here in this area. They're pretty accomplished. They're beautiful murals. So someone who did these was an accomplished artist. And the only thing we had to go on any of these, there were a few of them on the backs. They had like hallway listed or dining room or something like this. So other than that, it's hard to say, you know, and I'd hate to speculate on, on who the artist was. Cordova is asking anyone with information on the murals to contact the museum. And we need someone to help us crack the case. So if you have any information, please give it to us. Please contact the museum, call us, or go to our website and email us. We'd love to know more about these murals. The more information we have, the more we can help provide education for the public. In Kalispell, Sean Wells, MT News. All right, stick around everybody because when we come back, we'll see how this Montana city is changing its approach to their urban trees. There's a lot more MTN Outdoors to come right after this. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Hey, welcome back everybody. These next pair of stories are all about trees. 
it is okay, sort of all about trees. It's a bit of a stretch. Just stick with me here. I'll explain it. One story is about using trees to teach Montana school kids about a very primal but important survival skill alongside with growing a real appreciation of the great outdoors in our next generation of Montanans. But this first story is all about trees and how our largest city in the state is changing up their approach to planting them. Part of the reason we love Montana is because of our impressive landscapes, and that includes the thousands of trees that cover the treasure state. But some of them are increasingly at risk due to climate change, and many may vanish because of it. Cities across the country need to plant more trees, but not just any trees. We think a lot about tree diversity. We've been thinking about it ever since I've been here, which has been about seven years, how to get trees that will survive climate change because it's been a factor ever since I've been here. Trees are critical infrastructure that can help cities withstand the effects of climate change by providing shade, absorbing stormwater, and filtering air pollution. But for that to happen, the trees themselves need to be resilient, according to McConnell. There just really aren't a lot of native trees. Everyone always says, well, you should get native trees. There just really aren't that many. We have some near natives that work well here. While climate conditions hurt trees like the cottonwoods that struggle with extreme cold and snow load, others like the ash and elm trees can be damaged by pathogens or pests, like the Dutch elm disease or emerald ash borer, which have yet to hit Montana. The city plants around 200 trees a year and spends around five to 10,000, according to McConnell. But tending to them raises the time and resources significantly. For the most part, uh, we need trees that are gonna survive in this climate because we don't have the time or resources to provide a lot of nurturing care to trees. Local Billings arborist Josh Smith has been working in his field for over a decade and says the importance of keeping trees healthy can't be overstated. I focus on dead mitigation, crown reduction, or crown thinning, um, like structural pruning, like anything that I can do to keep that tree around for the next hundred years. And he says a tree kept healthy is one that better handles not only the climate, but other issues as they present themselves. A lot of those like bugs and other crap that come along is simply because a tree cannot withstand like the stresses of it because it's stress from something else. Too much or not enough water can be a cause of the stress, which is attributed to climate change, according to Smith. He says generally the issues start in the roots and present in the foliage. And while the city aims for a diverse tree population, McConnell mentioned that which trees survive in Billings may be left up to survival of the fittest. I think we're gonna have to start going with some of the trees that we kind of think are the ragged survivors, kind of, that we don't favor that much right now. In Billings, Phil Van Pelt, MTN News. Are they are they actually dry? Mm, they look dry. They're I could they feel cold. So many kids today don't get to spend time out in the woods like generations past have. They're doing ex sports and extracurriculars, or they're spending their free time inside right, instead of outside. And it's really great to see kids get outside, learn skills that they can really feel accomplished about, and that they can use throughout their lives and just get to experience the outdoors. It's a really wonderful place to be and it generally brings a sense of relaxation and peace to people. And we like to get kids out. Ravenwood Outdoor Learning Center held a class to teach families how to create fire in the wet winter woods. So it's really important to have a class like this because it's one of those skills that a lot of people don't necessarily think about having. Especially, you know, we have a lot of technology at our disposal most of the time today. Program director Ashley McDonald says most people have the luxury of using their handheld lighters to ignite a fire, but in an emergency situation. You might not know what to do because you've either always assumed it was really easy or you've just never thought about it at all. This class was not just for children. People of all ages were able to learn how to spark a flame. While some of the parents made their kids take the class, they ended up enjoying the activity and spending time with their families. We thought it would be boring, but we're kind of glad that we went because we wouldn't be doing this right now. And getting to walk around in the forest with them and collecting materials and seeing what we can find together. The leaders of the class taught everyone what materials are flammable and dry when most everything in the woods is wet this time of year. Um, they have to be. They have to be dry if you if you want your fire to be nice. Having the skills to make a fire in the woods is important, especially if an emergency arises. But this class was also a good way to just get outside. If you would like to see what other classes Ravenwood offers, you can visit ravenwoodolc.org. A walk in the woods can be so thrilling if you take the time to really appreciate it. In Columbia Falls, Kiana Wilson, MTN News.
All right, for this next story, we'll head out to the slopes and take a look at a piece of technology that's designed to help you stay safe out there. But in reality, it's actually causing a lot of headaches for local law enforcement. We'll throw things back to MTN's Phil Van Pelt for more. Many smartphones have quick access to dialing 911 in the event of an emergency, but now Apple Watches can detect a crash and alert the authorities if there's been one. However, it can't always differentiate between a vehicle crash and just wrecking on the ski hill. We took our numbers, you know, for 911 missed dials from previous years, even last year. They're up 30% this year. A call to 911 is always taken seriously. Currently, though, if you're a dispatcher near a ski hill, there may be an increase in false alarms after a new Apple 14 update. When people crash up there and they have these watches, uh, they automatically uh, will dial 911, but then it's an open ended line. And so our dispatchers are able to tell, you know, if there's a true emergency or if they can hear the the rustling in the background and that it's just a missed dial. On the mountain, GM Jeff Schmidt says the constant calls from Rex could cause more harm than good. The watch doesn't know if you fell and broke your back or if you fell because you hit a piece of ice and you're getting back up. But if the watch is set to that and calls 911, to me that's a problem. It, you know, it robs the resources of 911 for something else. The watches use GPS to determine speed and microphone activity that could signal a crash and even G-force detection. But it's that GPS location that's helping the emergency department figure out what's really going on. As long as we can see the person coming down from the top of the mountain making their way down to the bottom, it doesn't worry us too much so long as we do have movement for the skier who was involved. Carbon County says they're receiving about two calls a day from ski crashes. An annoyance, yes, but one the dispatch supervisor is happy to live with. God forbid you forget to turn that back on when you leave the mountain and end up in a crash. We would rather not even risk that. In Red Lodge, Phil Van Pelt, MTN News. There is a buzz in the air when it comes to helping save our state's bees. We'll take a look at what's being done when MTN Outdoors returns right after this. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back, everybody. Now, I probably don't need to tell you this, but I'm going to anyway because I'm on the clock. The ag industry here in Montana is built on the backs of a lot of people and animals. And in these next stories, we'll see how some very small but very important pieces to our farming and ranching puzzle here in Montana are being helped by us and in some cases, helping us. Last week, the U.S. Department of Agriculture approved the first honeybee vaccine to fight an aggressive bacterial disease. This step is big news for beekeepers. It's the buzz of the bee community right now, the world's first bee vaccine, offering hope for a problem that currently has no cure. American fowl brood is a disease that bees get, and it affects the larvae in the hive. Right now, the bees in the drained apiary hives in Laurel are just staying warm, but soon they'll play an essential part in the ecosystem. Just because they make honey isn't only what they do, they pollinate. They pollinate the crops, so the farmers need us to come out and bring our bees. Drange won't administer the vaccine, which is given to the queen through a sugar jelly, but they'll certainly benefit. We're buying 5,000 queens a year. We'll actually inoculate their hives. Montana is actually one of the top honey producing states in the nation, ranking number two in 2015. The vaccine will reportedly be available for purchase this year, and while this won't cure all that ails a dwindling honeybee population, it's a step in the right direction. If we've got this, maybe it's going to cure European fowl brood. Maybe we'll find another cure for the mites or another disease that we're already dealing with with our bees. As they work to protect this important population. In Laurel, Haley Monaco, MTN News. These two are about as cowboy or as cowgirl as it gets, and they might be quiet sitting atop smooth guy right here, but when it comes to work and home, they're the best of friends. Walk up there. There's no bond quite like a cowgirl, her horse, and her dog. He is a best friend more than he is a dog. That's Lexi Coniglione talking about Fez, her Border Collie Australian Shepherd mix. The two run all over the northern Great Plains. And for a year and a half old, Fez is beyond his years. He's really smart, um, especially for a young dog. He, he's never got himself in trouble. He's never got himself in what we would call a wreck. Lexi found Fez when she needed him most. They say bad things come in threes, but for me it came in four. 
Three prominent figures in Lexi's life passed away, and to tack onto it, her once best dog that was in a deadly accident. Four losses that are tough to bear. Kind of just one of those chapters in my life where it was, I, I wouldn't say I was at rock bottom by any means, but really struggling to kind of figure out how to get through that. As much as Fez is all business when the herd is near, he has a more important Fair. job. This dog in particular just wouldn't leave me alone, but he didn't ever ask me to say anything. He didn't ever ask for a conversation. He just wanted to be right next to me. And so um, sometimes you find yourself driving around or doing your errands and you feel really lonely. But when you have a dog that is just leaning on your shoulder, or puts his chin right on your shoulder and just lets you know that you're not by yourself. Life's curveballs haven't broken the two down. In fact, the two were moving forward. Fez won the Northwest Division for the Farm Dog of the Year competition through the American Farm Bureau. I think it's so much fun to talk about my dog. I mean, he's like my pride and joy for sure. A trophy and some chow from Purina is a nice prize, but the contest has opened up doors for Lexi to show that farm dogs are more than just a tool. I know there's a little bit of stigma in certain areas about farm dogs or ranch dogs um, just being a tool, and they're not. I mean, they wouldn't work for you if they didn't just absolutely think you were over the moon. When the sun sets, it's the two against the world. Where I was at a low point, not really that I was missing some confidence, but it, it's really nice to hear other people are just as proud of something that you're building as you were. Building a friendship that'll last a lifetime. In Glasgow, Ryan Gamboa, MTN News. Well, that should just about do it for us here this week at MTN Outdoors. Thanks, as always, for spending some time with me. And remember, keep those photos coming my way to andy.curtis at ktvh.com. If you're doing something outside here in Montana, I want to see a picture of it. Skiing, snowshoeing, ice fishing, uh, just standing there, T-bowing. Remember when that was a thing? Take a photo, send it to andy.curtis at ktvh.com, and you could see yourself at the end of a future episode just like these folks, it's time for this week's MTN Outdoors Brag Board. Our picture this week is of a very special time in a kid's life. Their very first fish. And I would like you all to join me in celebrating little Luke's first catch here. His dad, Big Luke, wrote me saying that they're from Chinook. And he took three-year-old little Luke here to the first lake south of Haver for this catch. And if you can't tell by that big smile he's wearing, he's pretty proud of it. So congratulations, guys. Let me know how you cooked that up, and please send it a picture of his second and third fish, too. Oh, and go sugar beaters. Thanks again, everybody, and remember, until next week, stay safe, stay warm, and I'll see you out there. MTN, Montana's news leader.